Well, Genesis 23, if you want to uh, turn there. I don't know if you've uh, read ahead. If you did, your impression might have been like mine was uh, early in the week. And I always, early on, uh, begin to read ahead and kind of try to think through and where we'll be going in terms of, uh, you know, what is the message about and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And this is one where you read and it's Abraham and Sarah dies and he goes and he bides the fields and he, and he buries her. And I'm kind of reading through that and going, get in. <laughs> where, 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 do we, where do we exactly go with this Lord <laughs> in terms of teaching this passage and, and finding some uh, application for us? And, but it's one of those that it is a very interesting passage of Scripture, and it really kind of opens up when you know a couple of key things that are going on in the negotiation, the price that's paid, who Abraham is dealing with, and so forth. Um, I at least found it, uh, found it uh, pretty interesting. So we're, we're going to be looking at chapter 23 this morning. Well, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we look at the burial of Sarah, and Lord, all, many of us have, uh, have done this. We've had people that we love that are very close to us, that have, uh, have passed away, that have gone to be with you. Uh, and then in the aftermath, there is the, the details of, of a burial and a service and, and all that goes with it. And how do we handle that, Lord? What is the, what is the way that we go about that? And uh, Lord, uh, we know that you can teach us so much through your word, through the life of Abraham, and, and even in this episode of, of burying his wife. But Lord, we pray that we'd see so much more in this story than a, than a simple burial. So use your word to, again, uh, teach us, minister to our hearts this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of uh, Pastor Chuck's mentors that he would mention often was uh, Dr. Uh, Duffield and Dr. Van Cleef. That he, has, uh, as a young guy growing up, I've, I've heard them via, uh, via CD and uh, cassette tape and stuff over the years. And I don't remember which one it is, but uh, uh, one of them said that when he, when he died, and apparently actually did this, he said he wanted to be buried in his coffin. He wanted to have his Bible in one hand and a plastic fork in the other one. That's a little bit of a strange request. You know, I think we get the preacher wanting his Bible with him. <clears throat> the plastic fork. You know, I kind of grew up in this setting, you know, going to church potlucks and stuff. We don't really do it here, but typically... Uh, as they would serve the potluck meal and you're going through the line, someone would always say, and save your fork because there's dessert. And we don't have forks to go around, so save your fork. There's going to be dessert later. I, mean, I just heard that all the time as a kid growing up, and apparently uh, uh, this gentleman did as well. So the idea was, I want my Bible with me because it tells me where I'm going. And I want that plastic fork because that says the best is yet to come. <laughs> and, uh, and apparently he was actually uh, uh, buried, buried that way. Dealing with death, sometimes a, a, difficult, uh, a difficult thing. And uh, Abraham is here at the death of his wife, whom he's probably been married for for 100 years. I mean, she's 127. They probably have, I've been to a few 50th anniversary you know, uh, celebrations that uh, I don't think any of us will ever see 100. But uh, that's a long time to be together. They've been on this sojourn that we've been tracking since Genesis 12 for 62 years. We've been kind of following their, their lives. And um, a, a tremendous loss. And now, and now he's got to, there was no pre, pre-packaged burial plans <laughs> in those days. You kind of dealt with it. And you had to deal with it right, a, right away as well. Uh, and that's what he's facing here. And there's a lot we can, couldn't learn. Well, let's look at the first two verses, and we'd say it's the, the death of a princess. Certainly, it was uh, she is called by God in chapter 17, the, uh, a princess, and, uh, and certainly referred by Abraham in that way, I think, in many, in many ways as well. Verse 1 and 2, Sarah lived 127 years. There were, they were, uh, these were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And uh, again, certainly Abraham's uh, princess. And uh, we can calculate that, uh, again, they've been tracking together since chapter 12. We've been following their lives for uh, what would have been 62 years. 
We mentioned in the story of uh, Abraham taking Isaac up to Mount Moriah that he would have been a, a young man, probably in his mid-20s uh, at that point. And uh, he is 37 years old at this point, at the death of his mother. And Abraham would go on and outlive her by uh, another 38 years. Uh, she's been through all these experiences uh, from leaving Ur of the Chaldeans, uprooting, moving, living for a period of time in Haran, finally coming into the land of Israel. She's there for the triumphs of Abraham's faith as well as the failures. Of course, she's drug with him down to Egypt where she almost becomes the wife of Pharaoh. God intervenes and they uh, are able to escape and go back into the land. Uh, we see some other triumphs, again, of Abraham's faith that she was part of. But she's uh, part of those, but also kind of the debauchels in terms of she's the one that comes up with the idea to present Hagar to be Abraham's second wife, to have a child through him so that the promise of God could be kept. We have the birth of Ishmael. We have the resentment from Hagar and then the dispute that breaks out. And, uh, and finally, they're, they're sent away. She's experienced all of this, and there hasn't been a lot of focus on her, but we know that she's growing in her faith right along with uh, Abraham. And we know that because we, we read about her in Hebrews 11. She is listed there in the, uh, uh, in the Hall of Fame of Faith, along with uh, so many others. Uh, as I said in uh, Genesis 17, 15, it's where God calls her a princess. The Apostle Peter names her as a good example that Christian wives should follow in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. P, uh, Paul uses her as an example to illustrate the grace of God in uh, Galatians 4. And the prophet Isaiah mentions her in chapter 51 where he says, Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you, becomes really the, the mother of the nation of, of Israel in that sense. But here, Abraham, she's called a princess. We know a little bit about her life, but uh, he is mourning. The passage begins, Sarah died, uh, and it ends uh, with similar language. Seven times there's the word buried or dead uh, inter interlaced. The second half of uh, the second verse says, Abraham came to mourn for Sarah, to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Going through the, the grief process that is important to go through. I mean, when someone is not crying at the death of a loved one, you kind of more have to worry about that person than the person who is crying and allowing that emotion to express itself as it should. And we see that here uh, in, in the life of uh, Abraham. Should you be crying and mourning at the death of a loved one? Absolutely. It's part of the healing process that God allows us to go through. But Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 that he, we are to sorrow, but he gives a caution. He says, but we're not to do it as others who have no hope. And certainly Abraham realized that Sarah was going to be with the Lord, that they would be reunited one day, and that becomes so, so very important. But he goes through this, uh, this process of weeping and mourning, and different people express it in, in different ways. There's one guy that I heard about that was such an uh, avid golfer every Saturday morning, same time, same course, same three buddies, no matter what, rain or shine, always out on the course. And one of the days they came to the ninth, uh, green, which happened to be ne right next to uh, uh, a little highway going by. And, uh, and sure enough, they were about ready to uh, putt on the green, and all of a sudden, here comes a hearse and a whole funeral procession. Now, the guys that he played with all these years never saw him do this before, but he stopped, he took off his hat, and he asked the other guys if they would do the same and just have a moment of silence as this thing went by, which they did. They were happy to do that. And then when they were done, one of the guys said, uh, Wow, that was uh, pretty cool. I've never, I didn't realize, you know, that you were so concerned and respectful, you know, uh, of something like that. And he says, well, after all, we were married 37 years. <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> Some people show their remorse a little different than others. But uh, Abraham is uh, weeping and mourning. I kind of have to say stuff like that in the first service because I'm not sure if they've really had enough Starbucks that morning or not. But... Uh, <laughs> I <clears throat> thought I would throw it in for you guys as well. Very interesting. This is the first time that the word tears 
or, or weeping is recorded in the Bible. Uh, Abraham weeping for Sarah. And of course, the Bible ends uh, in Revelation 21 4 with saying that in the end, then God will wipe away every tear from our, uh, our eyes. But uh, he knew she was with the Lord. But again, the Old Testament saints didn't have the complete picture of resurrection that we do. They haven't heard the words of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Uh, they don't have Paul's exhortation in 1 Corinthians 15 where he explains, and what will the resurrected body be like? The rhetorical questions. And he begins to go through example after example to try to help us understand the, the change and what it will be like and so forth. But they had uh, statements like Job's wonderful statement about the fact that he knew one day he would see his Redeemer and that he would be risen from the dead bodily. And it's quite a statement given the fact it's one of the oldest passages of Scripture in the Old Testament. Psalm 73, 24 says, You will guide me with your counsel, and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So they certainly have the understanding that dying in faith, they would be with the Lord forever, though they didn't have the complete understanding that we do, that to be absent from the body is to be present uh, with Christ, as Paul says in Philippians 1.21 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Revelation 14 says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And certainly that's contrasted in the parables of Jesus in terms of what happens to the, the wicked or those that die apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Again, in Job 18, it says it's like putting out a light. Uh, they are compared to animals that are in a trap. They are compared to criminals that have been caught. And they are compared to a tree that has been uprooted. It's quite a difference. And I, I can tell you it's quite the different experience when I do a memorial service for somebody because it's somebody's cousin or something and I don't really know them and I don't really know if they really knew the Lord. I, I never had a conversation with them, but they just asked me to come in and, uh, and uh, do what I can to uh, minister to the folks and I'm happy to do it. But it's, it's a little different than when it's somebody that I know and I know that they know the Lord and I know that uh, they're absolutely with the Lord. And, uh, and then the family members that are there that know the Lord. It's just, a, it's just a different atmosphere. It truly is, goes from being a memorial service to really a celebration, not just of their life, but a celebration of the fact that they are with Jesus Christ in heaven. Uh, and it's just uh, such a huge, huge contrast. So here, he is mourning for his wife. He's weeping for his wife as he should. But that's not to say that he doesn't know that she's with the Lord. He knows that. But in the midst of that, again, he, he doesn't just make a little phone call for his prearranged burial package. He actually has to now negotiate a place with a group of people who uh, we'll get introduced to here, the sons of Haith, we know as the kingdom of the Hittites. Uh, and they're a bad bunch of guys. I mean, when we read this, don't get a picture that he's sitting down a campfire with a couple of Bedouins and their camels hanging out here. Uh, because the sons of Haith, the Hittites, are numerous and well-organized, we know from archaeological uh, discoveries and, uh, and documents. Uh, their empire spreads all the way up into uh, what is present-day Turkey, where they were headquartered, uh, and they were armed to the teeth, by the way, as well. They were numerous, well-organized, and, uh, and they had a pretty good standing army. So when uh, Abraham sits down to have this conversation with these guys, uh, there's a lot of protocol going on here. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, sitting down and uh, he's going to say certain things. They're going to have certain reply uh, that is all all needs to be kind of deciphered here a little bit. It's kind of kind of interesting. Uh, even today, if you were like in Israel with us and you go in the Arab market and you're going to buy stuff, we would tell you <laughs> be careful. Uh, you know, negotiate. Just because the guy says the thing's worth a hundred dollars, it doesn't really mean it's worth a hundred dollars. You know, and at the end of the, every, you know, the day, people would get on the bus and look what I got for $20. This guy wanted $100. I got him all the way down to 20 bucks. And then someone would say, let me see that. Oh, I got one like it for 10 
And, uh, and then somebody else would say, I bought one from a kid for a buck. You know, I mean, so, you know, it's all over the negotiation is, uh, is paramount here. But uh, we'll see that Abraham, in a sense, goes through the protocol, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Uh, it's very interesting what's going on here. Let's look at verses 3 to 6. There's a request for a burial place. Then Abraham stood up from before the dead and spoke to the sons of Haith, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me prop, uh, property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Haith answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your dead. <laughs> are they really going to open up one of their tombs for him? No, it was just a very polite thing to say. It's, they're, they're saying, let's begin to negotiate. I mean, they're saying that, but none of these guys are going to open a tomb for, for Abraham. But it's like, let's hear what you have to say. Uh, we'll talk to you about it. Uh, and that's how the, this whole thing begins. He makes a request for a place to bury Sarah. And uh, we would say the truth is Abraham owned the whole land. It's just the Hittites didn't know that yet. <laughs> he wasn't going to bring that, up, that part up about, by the way, God gave me the whole thing, so I'm taking this part over here right, uh, right now, given the fact of who the Hittites are. And when is God going to give him the land to his descendants? And, uh, and he knows that. And so he begins this negotiation. But he makes a request based on the fact that he believes the promise. God is going to give me the land. It's going to be the land of my descendants. I'm going to bury my wife here. I don't care how much I got to pay. This is where she's going. This is where I'm going to be buried. This is where my son's going to be buried. This is where his son's going to be buried. And his son is going to be buried because God eventually is giving us this land. He can't see it. It's not there yet, but he absolutely believes the promise of God. Again, this is the Abraham in Genesis 12 that, that uh, leaves not fully and obedient to God. And we've seen his trials and tribulations on that scorecard. He got some C's, he got some A's, he got some F's. But by the time we get to chapter 22, this is the guy that takes his adult son up to Mount Moriah and is willing to sacrifice him if need be, believing God will raise him up from the dead. He's come a long ways in terms of his faith, and he totally believes, and though he doesn't see it in the Again, the sons of Haith, descendant of the son of Cain, are there. They are a type of Canaanite. They're in the land, but leaves one of these days, all these guys will be gone. One of these days, this will be our land. And it's based on that that he makes the request. Why here? Kirath Arba or Hebron. It's a special place to them. When they first come into the land, this is where they arrive. This is the first place that Abraham ever builds an altar and begins to worship the Lord publicly in the land. It's where he proclaims, and we said that means to preach the name of the Lord to everybody that would hear, and he continues to build altars, but it begins here uh, in Hebron. We know if we kind of backtrack a little bit that he and Sarah lived there for at least 25 years. And um, it's also the place where uh, they are when the angels of the Lord and the Lord himself comes as the angel of the Lord to say, this time next year, your wife Sarah will have a son. You're to name him Isaac. That whole scene takes place in, in Hebron as well as many others. So she dies, we'd say, in the heartland uh, of the land of Israel, believing the promise, never seeing it in her lifetime. And Abraham knows that. Back in chapter 12, just again, the reiteration to your offspring, I give this land. Chapter 13, all the land that you see I give to you and to your offspring forever. Later in chapter 13, arise and walk the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. In chapter 15, to your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then in chapter 17, that I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. He has no doubt that God is, is giving him the land. I, you know, I don't have it as a reference in your notes, but I just wanted to read kind of this, what I think is a, a key passage here in chapter 11, uh, talking about this, uh, this idea of uh, he realized that he wouldn't see it in his lifetime, 
but it didn't bother him. He knew that it was going to come to his descendants. Uh, chapter 11, verse 10 of Abraham, it says, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born many as the stars of the sky in the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Isn't that what Abraham just said to these guys? I'm a stranger and I'm a pilgrim here. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they deserve a better. That is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. He says, I can't really see it right now, but I know this is going to be ours because God promised us. I'll pay anything for it because I don't really care about my money because I'm not living for this life. I'm living for a city whose builder and maker is God. And one day I'll be with him forever. I'm not weeping and mourning like others who have no hope because my life is different. My outlook is different. And so he approaches these guys and begin to negotiate. And the second thing we, we notice about it is that Abraham has earned the respect of the sons of Haith. And we've already been introduced to who they are. Look at verse 6. Hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our burial places. Now, interesting, the word mighty there is the word Elohim. And uh, somehow they are familiar, or at least whatever word they use. Moses translates it Elohim. It literally means we recognize that you're a prince of God. We're not really walking with you. We don't really follow your God. We don't really worship your God. But we recognize you got something going. And we would say, you are a prince of God. You're something special in, uh, in his eyes. It's pretty, pretty good considering he's uh, negotiating with the Taliban here or whoever the, you know, whoever the equivalent would be today he's sitting down with. They're saying, hey, we got a lot of respect for you. We don't agree with you, but we got a lot of respect for you. We know you, you actually believe what you say you believe. Uh, and it's so important uh, in terms of our witness for others that... Uh, we would have the same kind of testimony. And if you hang in there, you know, and, and take whatever it comes, the ridicule, whatever it might be, uh, you know, people, people will respect you in, uh, in time. But again, it's a, a time of sorrow, but it's also a time when the, there's a tremendous uh, witness going on. And the unsafe can tell, can't they? When you lose, you know, your mom, your dad, or your brother or sister, or somebody close to you, uh, they watch your other family members that don't know the Lord, your neighbors, the people maybe you've been sharing with. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Do you really believe they're with the Lord? And is that how you're going to respond to all this? Abraham weeps and he mourns. It's part of the process. We should do that. But, but still, at the same time, we know that they're with the Lord. I, I can just tell you, it just makes all, all the difference in the world. I could have never stood up and done my mother's funeral if I didn't believe that. I can just tell you that right, right now. I could have never stood up and, and done um, my father-in-law's uh, funeral if I, if I didn't totally, totally believe that. And uh, the closer it gets, uh, the more meaningful it, it is. And, uh, and we could go on with those that we love that are with the Lord and know what a difference it's made. Well, let's get back to this idea of uh, she's a princess, and he's negotiating for the place. Man, look at this. He's this is not a good negotiating skill. He tells him straight out he's willing to uh, pay the full price. I mean, what he should have done was said, you know, you got this cave down here at Machpelah. It's not really a good place for a burial. I've noticed some others that are better, but, you know, it's kind of convenient. So uh, I don't have a lot of money, but, you know, maybe we can negotiate. You know, I don't think it's worth a lot. So what do you think? But what does he do? He says, I want that place, that place only. I'm going to pay anything for it. You name your price. Give me the full price. I'll pay anything. We would say, well, come on, Abraham. That's not too smart in terms of negotiations. 
But it's very interesting what happens here, and I think the motivation for it. Look at verse 7. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Haith, and he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, uh, and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at full price as property for a burial place among you. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Haith, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham. He's right there in the crowd. Abraham in the presence of the sons of Haith, all who entered at the gate of his city, saying, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bear your debt. That means I'm willing to talk about it. Verse 12, then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land. And he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, if you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me, and uh, I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, my Lord, uh, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between me and you? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron. And Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Haith 400 shekels of silver currency of the merchants. So he makes the request <laughs> before asking the, asking the price. Always ask the price first. Uh, but it's an open, honest uh, question. And notice he's saying, I'd like the cave. Uh, Ephron says, uh, I'm going to throw in the land. In fact, I insist, you're going to have to buy the whole thing. He, I'm not just going to sell you the, uh, the cave. So it's kind of a, an interesting maneuver. Hey, we're just among friends. I'll just give you the whole thing. You know, what the heck? Well, again, we know from archaeological writing that the Hittites had to pay tribute on all the land they own. This is not, nobody's planting a garden in Hebron, right? It's, it's pretty, pretty arid, pretty desert-like there and stuff. So this guy's paying tribute on it. So, hey, I've got an opportunity here. This guy comes along, says he wants the cave, and he's going to pay any price that I name. So I'm going I'm to ratchet this thing up a little bit. I'm going to tell him he's got to buy the whole field as well. Abraham does know two pieces of information. He's willing to sell, but he's got to buy the entire cave. And basically, Ephraim feels like he's got Abraham in a corner here. So we notice that Abraham must now purchase the cave and the field, and it's full price so how much is the full price? Well, a shekel is not a coin in that day. Coinage doesn't come along for several centuries. It's a measurement, <coughs> excuse me, a, a weight. So basically, he's asking for uh, six and a quarter pounds of silver. How much was the land worth in that day? Four shekels. <laughs> but he's asking 400. It's like you're trying to sell your house down here. It's worth $400,000. And somebody comes along and says, I love your house. I got to have it. I'm willing to pay full price. You go, well, I sure love it here, but I'm willing to give it to you for full price. It's $4 million. <laughs> and the guy goes, here, I'll write you a check. That, that's what's going on here. It, it's actually worth $40 million in comparison. It's, it's, it's an outrageous price. Uh, Abraham knew that, uh, that basically he was trapped. I don't think he cares that he's getting ripped off. He's got a lot of money. I don't think it really means a lot to him. So what's, what's going on uh, here? Well, I think he uses wisdom. The deal is transacted, notice, at the gate of the city. Uh, it's in full public view, full disclosure. The agreement, secondly, is struck in the hearing of all the Hittites as they watch the six pounds plus of silver being, being weighed out. Again, in the currency of the merchants, the way common business was done every day, and he's willing to pay this price. Why? Well, it's the first part of the promised land. This is, this is it. This is the first part of the promised land. He gets to buy a chunk, and he doesn't really care how much. And he's going to bury his wife there. It's in the heart of the promised land. This is where God wants them to be buried. 
He wants his own bones to rest there. They're going to get resurrected there. They're going to wait and see what God does. It's, it's very interesting. He doesn't really care. This is an outrageous amount of money he's paying. He's like, no problem. Here, boom. I just, uh, yeah, you may think you're ripping me off, but I know what God's going to do in the future. Let's go on with this. In verse 17, he receives, this is the only property he ever purchases. Verse 17, so the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Haith, before all who went <clears throat> in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Haith, as property for a burial place. <clears throat> Buying the property is a statement of faith. <clears throat> He's saying, I totally believe God's going to keep his word. And I don't care how much it costs. I'm going to bury my wife here. That's, that's what's going on. Ken Hughes kind of brings us to home. He says, and like Abraham, by faith, we invest in a promise, giving generously of our possessions and wealth for the preaching of the word to the ends of the earth laying up indestructible treasures, investing our time and our whole lives in a kingdom expansion, and in doing so, we declare by faith that we're heirs of the promise, even if our circumstances declare it's not so. Every time you, you give something to God monetarily, it's a statement of faith. You're saying, God is building his kingdom. God's kingdom is going to come. One day I'll be in that kingdom. One day I'll, I'll see it. And one day I'll have a reward in it. I don't see it right now. Every time you do it, it's a statement of faith, isn't it? You know, you're, you're not going to get a check from us at the end of the year saying, here's a <laughs> really good investment here. You, you made over 10% here at Calvary One Bird. You don't get nothing back. It's a promise of the future of what God's going to do. Interesting what, what he's doing here. Uh, very exorbitant what he's doing, of course. Uh, tremendous statement of faith. That's what this is all about. Uh, from this time on, the cave at Machpelah becomes an ossuary, a depository, uh, depository for the bones of the patriarchs and uh, insisting that they be buried in the heartland of the, of the promised uh, land. Uh, again, notice the, the care he gives for, for the body itself, just to point this out as well. Totally a, a statement of resurrection. This is where this idea of burial comes from. It goes all the way back to Abraham. Uh, you could look at other pagan religions. You look at Hinduism and so forth. They cremate. They burn the body because they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe there'll be a bodily resurrection. Uh, from Judaism into Christianity, we, we share the same concept uh, these days and traditionally within Christianity. We even bury face up because it's a, it's a testimony that the person's going to uh, rise from the dead at the time of, of the rapture, a bodily resurrection. Uh, and every time somebody was buried for 2,000 years, that way it was a testimony of uh, the fact that we believe in the resurrection. Now, these days, it, it's not such an issue. You know, I, I, you know, I plan on being cremated one of these days. Throw my ashes off, uh, off Lanikai is my plan. I'm pretty sure, I'm hoping that by then they don't start charging you for that. I'm pretty sure it's free now. But, uh, you know, it seems like a good deal to me, you know. And uh, I live my... Life, you know, loving the ocean and being around it. So that's, uh, that's good enough for me. But, for example, if, if I were, say, a missionary in India and I died, don't cremate me. You bury me in the ground as a testimony to everybody that's around me that I'll be resurrected, that there's continuity with the body that goes in the ground and will come rise again. Because there needs to be that kind of testimony in a place like that. You know, it's a little different here uh, for us uh, in the islands we understand the tradition, but we also understand that crema cremation just does speed it up, what's going to happen naturally. It's from dust that we're going to return anyway. But here, this is all about a, a testimony of the bodily resurrection. And again, I mentioned 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to read through it later, Paul gives several illustrations. One of them is of a seed. Uh, and he says the body, uh, how will it rise again from the dead? It's like a seed that's placed in the ground. The seed is placed in the ground, and it dies, and then something comes up from it. It doesn't look like a seed, <laughs> right? It looks like 
what it, whatever that plant is in the seed. There's a continuity. I can't plant a watermelon seed and get corn. You know, there's continuity, but it's completely different. I'm kind of happy about that. I'm pretty, I'd be kind of bummed out if this body was going to get resurrected and uh, with the same aches and the pains and because uh, it's, it's, there's continuity, but it's completely different. You'll see me in heaven. I'll be the guy with the real thick, wavy hair. <laughs> completely different. Won't that be disappointing when we get to heaven and everybody's bald? I, I just <laughs> gives me shivers. I don't even want to think about it. But again, the illustration of planting a seed in the ground. Christian burial is a witness and a testimony of the future resurrection that we're going to have in the Lord. The uh, second thing about this property, it's purchased, it becomes the tomb of many. And this is uh, very interesting. I kind of want to go through this litany of the life of Abraham and others and what they did by faith, though we've been over it before, but it all ties to this idea of this cave of Machpelah. We would say first, by faith, Abraham believes God's promise and his descendants would inherit the land. By faith, Abraham sojourned in the land for almost a century, living as though one who actually belonged and lived for another country. By faith, Abraham purchased the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, and by faith, he buries Sarah in that cave. By faith, Isaac buries Abraham with Sarah later, and we'll get to that in chapter 25. <clears throat> What's interesting about that is Ishmael comes back at the death of his father, and the two boys bury their father together. And uh, it's quite, quite the picture of what goes on in modern Israel today. If you don't know, Hebron is in the Palestinian hands and so, and so forth. And uh, it's very difficult. You can imagine how important this site is to Jewish people, uh, as well as to Christians, because Abraham is there, Sarah is there, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, uh, Leah. You know, they're all there in this tomb. But it's very difficult for them to get to it. There's a mosque built over it to this day. On the other side of what would have been the field, there's a synagogue. There's a little bit of a conflict going on uh, on there. And it's very difficult for them uh, to get into the, to these areas. Uh, it's also interesting to me when we think about the fact that uh, Abraham paid the price for this. In Israel today, all the land that Israel owns, Israel bought. And they bought at an exorbitant price. It wasn't worth it. They paid whatever the Arabs wanted. They paid it. When the UN in 1948 said you can become a state, they didn't give them any land. They just said, we give you permission to be a state. All the land they purchased. And yet they get referred to as the occupiers <laughs> and what they've taken away from some, someone else. They bought everything, except when they were attacked uh, by Egypt, Syria, uh, and, and Jordan, then they took property that they gained in that attack. How, how was the property taken care of in the hands? Again, Jordan is the current Palestinian state. They say they don't have one, but it's, it, it's, uh, it is Jordan. And for example, when they controlled, East, when they controlled Jerusalem, uh, they controlled all the burial places uh, of the Jews on there on the side of the uh, Mount of Olives that you can uh, see today. And, uh, and when, uh, when they had control of that, one of the things they did was burn down every synagogue, almost 30 of them. As soon as, as soon as the UN says, you've got control of this in 1948, that's the first thing the Jordanians did, burn down every synagogue in the area, kill or drive out every Jewish person that uh, lived in those areas. Then they went to that ancient Jewish graveyard on the side of that hill and took every Jewish marker and they used them to pave the rows and the floors in their bathrooms, in their public bathrooms. That's what they did with the grave markers. Uh, this is who Israel is up against today. Every piece of property they've got, they've purchased, except for the ones that when they were attacked, they were able to gain back again and then restore that which was rightfully theirs from God to start with. But uh, this thing, very interesting, we'll get to chapter, this chapter where you've got Ishmael and you've got Isaac together. But again, our point is they are there at the cave of Machpelah burying their father. By faith, Jacob buries his father Isaac uh, there at Hebron. By faith, while in Egypt, Jacob charges his sons to bury him in Hebron. So, you know, Joseph ends, ends up the prime minister of Egypt. Of course, you know, they have the whole reconciliation with the sons. Jacob and everybody moves down to Egypt. But he says when he's there, yeah, this is okay. I'm okay being here, you know, here in Egypt. But you promise me 
that when I die, you get my body back to the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, in the heart of the land, because God will give us the land one day. I may be living down here in Egypt. It may not look like it right now, but God is going to give us the land. It becomes quite a statement of faith, this, this cave at, uh, at Machpelah. By faith, Jacob's sons had him embalmed, and they took him back for burial. We'll see that in chapter 50. And then uh, one of the last lines in the, in the Genesis record is, Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Joseph dies at 110. They embalm him. They put him in a little coffin, uh, Egyptian style, but with the promise that someday God will raise him up. Someday God will deliver him, and someday take me out of here. 430 years later, a guy named Moses comes on the scene and uh, is able to lead the people out of Egypt back into the land. They carried with them uh, in that Sinai uh, wandering for 40 years. Of course, everything God had them built in terms of the Ark of the Covenant, but they were carrying something else. <laughs> they were carrying Joseph's bones. And then by faith, when Joshua conquers the promised land, he takes Joseph's bones and he buries them in Hebron. It becomes an important place. Now, interesting, <clears throat> when the spies are sent into the land uh, to check it out, there's 12 of them, remember, 10 come back with a bad report, two with a good report. I'm sure there's a Sunday school so song that goes along with that somehow. But it's Caleb and Joshua that come back uh, with a good report. Now, they all agree that there's walled cities, well-fortified, and there's giants in the land. You know, the Goliaths, the nine, to, nine foot, nine, ten foot tall guys that are uh, running around, that are armed to the teeth. And the thin guys are going, we're like grasshoppers. <laughs> They'll kill us. Remember, <clears throat> Joseph, excuse me, Joshua and Caleb are going, God's with us. Let's go. You know, we can take these guys. They want to stone them for even saying, even going to the land. One of the places they go to, if you go back and read it, is they go to Hebron. The Hittites are there. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a big welcome mat, but they just had to see it. They just had to get there and set foot on it. And then later in the whole episode, you know, Joshua goes in. They split the land in, in two, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking Jericho. They conquer to the south. They conquer to the north. Same strategy that uh, General Allenby uses later uh, when he conquers and takes over from the Turks. He follows the strategy of Joshua. And then they divide up the land. And it's Caleb. He says, I, I want Hebron. He's 85 years old. And he says this in Joshua 14, 11. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there. And that the cities were great and fortified. It may be the Lord will be with me, and I will be able to drive them out, as the Lord has said. Cool guy, huh? I'm 85. I'm pretty sure I'm as buff and as strong as I was in my 30s and my 40s. I'm ready to take these guys on. I don't care if there's giants up there or not. I want to take Hebron. It has huge significance for the Jewish people. Did he, did he drive them out? Well, there's another little thing in verse 2 that's interesting because it's not just called uh, Hebron. It's also called Kirath Arba, which means the city of the four. Now, the, the ancient rabbis had a very interesting take on this. They said it was four famous couples. <laughs> they said who's buried there is Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and, uh, and Leah. And, and Leah is born there, by the way, because... She's really the esteemed wife because she has a son named Judah through whom the Messiah would come. She's the one that's buried there. But uh, I don't think Adam and Eve are buried there, but uh, just kind of interesting. Now, there's another take on it that I think is more applicable. What is it the city of four of? What were there for? Well, <clears throat> let's find out what happens to Caleb. Jo uh, Joshua 15, 14 says, Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there she, uh, Sheshai, Ahiman, Talmai, the children of Anak. Anak and his three sons, there's four giants, the city of the four. Caleb says at 85, I don't care. <laughs> Just give me permission, Joshua. I'll go drive those, those guys out. Where else do we hear about Hebron? When David, at the end of his wilderness wandering and all the uh, uh, 
running from Saul. Saul and his sons are finally killed on Mount Gilboa. You remember, they mourn the death of Saul, and now it's time. And the people come to David to finally make him king, the rightful anointed king. Where do they anoint him king? Hebron. It's an important place. When you get to the end of Genesis, one writer said, you find that that tomb is quite full. <laughs> Alan Ross says this, the time of death, when the natural inclination is to mourn as the world mourns, should be the time of our greatest demonstration of faith. For the recipients of God's promises has a hope beyond the grave. Abraham is making quite a statement. It's, this is about burying his wife, but it's about the resurrection and it's about the promise of God. And when he's in front of these guys negotiating, he says, I'll pay anything. And they say, pay four million bucks. He goes, I'll write you a check right now. I don't care. This is the promised land. This is the heart of the promised land. This is what God's going to give us. This is what God's going to do. He put his money where his mouth was, didn't he? And it, was, and it was for his wife. He loved her. But he wanted them. He knew he would be there. His son would be there. His son would be there. And however long it took until God kept the promise that and his descendants would inherit the land. It's quite a statement of faith. <clears throat> How do we deal with the, the loss of a loved one? The way Abraham did. Weep and mourn. The greater love, the greater the weeping, the greater the mourning. But then bearing, as he did Sarah, believing in the resurrection. Paul says this, again, made reference to a portion of it, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep and has died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Every new revolution, every beautiful vision, every sweet.